Um, so today uh, we're focusing on common trees of Illinois. And this is going to be, um, again, it's an additive thing a little bit. Last, uh, last session, so on Monday, we covered the basics, uh, an introduction to tree ID, today's common trees. Friday is going to be uncommon trees, but we're gonna spend most, time, most of the time on these difficult groups. The species that are kind of hard to tell apart um, are oaks or hickories in particular. Our handouts for the workshop, um, and those are basically our slides. It's a PDF of the slides that I use. Um, for all three sessions are already up on this link. And I think Kevin's gonna enter uh, the link into the chat box. And it also, it was sent out this morning um, on the reminder email. But this is where you can download um, the, the handouts for all three sessions. Uh, I did hear that some people are having some trouble printing them. Uh, Kevin had a great comment that you may need to download them on the, onto your computer and then print them from there instead of trying to print them from the link. Uh, I'm not sure. But anyway, you can follow along or you can have these as a resource for later. So today, like I said, we're gonna cover about 20 different species uh, that I think are fairly common across Illinois. Uh, we're gonna focus on the characteristics and features for those species that you need for winter ID. Uh, I'll start with a very brief re review of the characteristics we talked about last time. And um, I know there's so many trees in Illinois and we're only covering 20. Um, but that only gives us a little less than three minutes per species to cover in detail. Uh, so we had to limit it to 20 just because uh, of, of our time constraints with an hour. But we'll go into as much detail as we can, but just know there's a lot of other species out there that we're going to be unable to cover in this workshop. All righty, just really quick, uh, characteristics for winter ID that we talked about last time. And we're going to mention these things. Um, at, with all of the, the species that we cover. Um, it's going to be stuff like on the bud or the twigs. So the terminal bud, which is the end bud that's at the tip of the twig. Um, the lateral buds, which are our side buds on the sides of the twigs, they're typically leaves. Um, bud scale scars, which is where last year's terminal bud was and it's kind of the initiation of the new growth. And then a lot of twigs have little dots on them. Uh, we call lenticels, they're for gas exchange. Uh, leaf scars on a twig is where the leaves were previously attached. Um, when they fall off, it leaves a bit of a scar. That's very um, consistent across particular species, and it's a very common characteristic used to identify. Inside of the leaf scars are where the, the plumbing of the leaves are connected to the twigs, and so those are our bundle scars. Those as well sometimes are in uh, recognizable patterns that can help arrange or help identify. Uh, and then we have <clears throat> our, our arrangement. So in, a, in the summer, that would be leaf arrangement. Here we consider it bud or branch arrangement. Um, the first question that you, you look at when you look at a tree to try to identify it, I do, is the first thing you need to figure out, is it opposite or alternate? There is the weird ones that are whorled as well, which has three or more, but opposite has two buds across from each other. Alternates one bud at a time and they alternate back and forth across the twig. Again number one question you need to figure out when you're identifying a tree. First thing you do when you look at it, figure out is it opposite or alternate. And then for a few of them, uh, the pith, the condition, the color of the pith is going to be uh, a good characteristic for identification. Not many, but there is a handful and we'll mention two today at least um, that the pith comes into effect when we're looking at the characteristics to identify. And then there's the bark and there's a bunch of different bark characteristics or ways of identifying bark or describing them. Um, here are the ones, the terms that I like to use. So we have ridge and furrow, which are long ridges um, that kind of stick out with furrows or, or depressions along them. Flaky peeling bark are, is bark that's papery, thin, peels off or flakes off. Uh, shaggy bark is similar where it does, the bark does tend to, to peel off or break off, but it's going to be thick or hard um, bark and not papery or thin. Platy also is um, bark that kind of peels away, but it, it peels kind of from the side instead of the top and the bottom like shaggy. Tight or smooth bark is bark that's really, um, there's not a lot of pattern to it. Um, it's usually thin bark, tight uh, against the tree. And then blocky bark is a term we kind of use to identify 
thicker bark that's patterned, but it's not in a recognizable ridges or anything like that. You'll hear these terms throughout the day, um, for sure, throughout the workshop. And then there's some other characteristics, habitat, where the, the tree grows is important. Um, it can help a lot with identification. The overall form of the tree, what does it look like? Is it ascending branches, descending branches, a rounded canopy, a thin canopy? You'll hear that a lot as well. And then if there's any unique features um, that really help to identify that tree, we'll mention those as well. So again, that's really quick, the characteristics. Every tree that we talk about today, we're gonna try to cover all of these characteristics um, for the, each tree. Um, hopefully we'll care, uh, cover it in enough detail that you'll be able to identify those trees afterwards. But we'll jump right in with the first group. And so we're gonna talk about maples. Overall in Illinois, there's six different maple species that are native to Illinois. For this workshop, we're gonna talk about four of them. We're going to talk about box elders, which a lot of people don't even realize um, is a maple. Uh, red maple, silver maple, and sugar maple. Um, one thing about maples, as we learned uh, at the day one, our maples as a group are opposite um, trees. So they have oppositely arranged buds, oppositely arranged branches and, and leaves as well. So that's um, a handy thing. So all of these maples kind of fall into that opposite grouping. So the first I'll talk about is box elder. So box elder is one of our most common maples. Uh, we see it across the whole state. Again, it is an opposite, uh, oppositely arranged plant. You can see here, if you can see my cursor, we have two buds across from each other here. Um, we're only seeing one on this side, but on the opposite side is another one. So it's, it's very clearly opposite. This one, um, for box elder, the buds are rounded. So the rounded buds that are white uh, often have kind of a white fuzz or hairiness to them that really stands out. Where the buds are, um, there's usually a really distinctive leaf scar. The leaf scar is right under the buds. They often come up and meet around the twig. So the leaf scar on the left bud kind of meets the leaf scar on the right bud. And it forms this distinctive V wherever you find the buds. Um, you can see that here on the, the twig to the right. And even if you look at the little picture on the left, you can see there, there's that distinctive V right beside those, um, those little branches there. The twigs on box elder are usually green in color, um, although that's not always the case. They can be purple, uh, red in color as well. So they do vary, but oftentimes you'll find green twigs when they're small as they get a little larger, or get a couple years on them, they'll turn more of a brown color. And then the twigs often with box elder will have a bit of a waxy covering on them. And you can kind of wipe that off. You'll see it has a little bit of sheen on it. You can rub your finger against it and it'll wipe off a little bit. The bark on box elder is a light tan or brownish color. Um, on younger branches, as you see in the middle picture there, it's smooth and you may have some dots on it. As it um, ages and the, the tree gets bigger, it'll have a shallow ridge and furrow with age with them, uh, but it kind of retains that light brown color. Um, it often is just a, a unique feature, often holds its Samara, its fruit, uh, throughout winter. So many times you can see that um, even this time of year, you can go out and there'll be fruit hanging off of, of box elders. Box elder is a medium sized tree. Uh, it often has uh, trunks that are branched low to the ground, has many branches coming out of it. Um, usually it's a spreading or irregular canopy. And so it, it is not a good form tree in that way. And many times with box elder, you'll have a lot of sprouts along the main trunk. And so if, if you've noticed, I've tried to underline certain characteristics for each of these trees. Those to me, the ones that are underlined are the in really important characteristics that'll get you to, to help to identify that particular tree. And most of the box elders I see um, have a lot of sprouts coming out of their trunk. You can see the picture in the middle here, those sprouts are, um, the younger ones are green in color. So you can really see that green color. Uh, but to me, you know, with box elder, you're looking for that light tan color and opposite with the green twigs. And it is one that prefers open areas, disturbed sites. Um, riparian areas. It seems to come in after flooding. Um, it's, it's a 
somewhat of a habitat generalist, but does prefer more moist soils. Um, not very shade tolerant, so you're going to find it in areas where uh, there's been some disturbance or old field sites or something like that. So the second maple I'm going to talk about is red maple. So red maple is also opposite like all maples. This one's interesting in that um, the buds are red in color. They could be pointed or they could be rounded. And we talked a little bit about this on Monday. Um, the flower buds or the buds when they're getting closer to opening will swell and become much more rounded. Uh, but sometimes the buds are pointed on this one. Uh, if you look closely at the buds, there's usually a hairy um, margin of this on the scales of the bud and it shows up here in these pictures, you can see a little bit of white hairs right at the scale margins. Um, as the buds swell, they become very recognizable because of the contrast between the red scale color and the white hairs. Um, their leaf scars are U-shaped. Um, they often meet in a V as well, just like the box elders. Um, the twigs are slender uh, and often are bright red in color, like you see here, but they can also be brown to gray um, in color as well. Red maple bark is light gray. So box elder was light tan or brown. This is a gray. Um, as it ages, it turns darker. Uh, the, the younger branches are smaller. Trees are very smooth. Um, as it grows, it becomes um, more rough, thicker bark, and it'll have narrow vertical plates or almost ridge, uh, kind of scaly or um, scaly or almost peeling uh, ridges on it, uh, on, the, on the larger trees. You can see on the right there. Red maple in general is a medium sized fast growing tree. Uh, it's upright in nature on smaller trees. So when you see a stand of young um, red maples, oftentimes their canopies are narrow and the tree's very tall. As you can see in the middle pictures there, as it ages, uh, it'll get more of a larger rounded canopy. Uh, this is a habitat generalist. You, it's a true habitat generalist. It grows anywhere from low swampy areas, really wet soils all the way up to dry ridges. So you'll see it kind of across the spectrum of forest habitats um, is where you may find red maple. I tend to see them a little more in those kind of higher areas of the of wet soil. So kind of the, sh the toe slopes on, or uh, wet coves or even uh, the higher ends of bottomlands is kind of where I see a lot of red maple, but, but understand they could go anywhere. Um, Interestingly enough, this time of year, red maple is probably the first, one of our first native plants to bloom. Uh, it often blooms in late January or very early February here in Southern Illinois. So um, it's, it's getting close to blooming if it's not, if you can't already find some already blooming in this part of the country. Now the, the next maple is, um, I'll say is kind of hard to tell apart from red maple just by looking at the twigs or the very young plants. Um, they do look very similar. When they get a little older, they start having some different characteristics. Um, but I will say that it can be hard to tell a young sapling red maple from a young sapling silver maple. Their habitats overlap a little bit. Their, their twig characteristics overlap quite a bit. They also have uh, reddish pointed or, or sometimes rounded buds. Um, flower buds can be rounded and clustered just like on um, red maple. They also have the hairy uh, hairs at the scale margins. In general, um, the twigs are not as red and the buds are not as bright red in color as red maple, although there is definitely some variation there. One thing that's been reported and I haven't tested it myself are the twigs have an unpleasant scent. If you scratch the bark on them and smell them, they smell um, bad. I can't, I can't verify that because I've never tried it. Uh, I need to go smell some silver maple twigs just to make sure. Um, but again, can be a little difficult at times to tell the two apart um, just from the young twigs. Now, as the trees age, they do look a little different. Um, Silver maple has a silver gray smooth bark on younger stems. As they age, the bark gets a little more flaky, a little more peeling than you see with um, red maple. And also these, um, these narrow plates or these flakes 
um, on larger individuals will noticeably twist as the bark goes up. So that's a common characteristic I use to figure out silver maple, even from a, lo a long distance. Bigger silver maples, they'll have um, often have a noticeable twist pattern to the, the bark instead of coming straight up and down. But you can see here the narrow plates starting to peel off or that are almost flake off on the, the larger silver maples. Um, in terms of habitat, uh, it is a medium to large tree. They can actually get quite large, rounded, broadly rounded canopy. Um, this one, typically, if you see them a lot, they form major branches low to the trunk. So instead of having one major trunk that goes up, a lot of times these will split close to the ground um, or uh, have side branches that come off close to the ground. Habitat wise, this grows in bottomlands and riparian areas. It is one that you'll find in low wet soils. Um, there are a little overlap with red maple, but in the wetter sites is where you'll find this than where you find red maples. Though I will add, it is commonly used as an ornamental. Um, in those areas, kind of that, that right at the intersection of the higher parts of the bottomland and the really wet areas where you may have either red maple or silver maple, one thing that I do, uh, and I don't mind saying it, is I look at the ground below the trees and look at the leaves just to verify what I'm talking about. And when I went out to find the spot to take these pictures, um, we had both red maple and silver maple growing there. And as I walked down the hill closer to the, the creek, um, there was a clear transition where a lot of the little stuff went from red maple and then it transitioned to it was all silver maple. And the easiest way to tell apart, tell that was looking at the ground and you went from having a ground covered in red maple leaves to a ground covered in silver maple leaves. So it was a, a clear transition. But even without that, um, that flakiness of the bark, uh, that twisting nature, and then the habitat itself will help you separate those two. Alrighty, the last of the maples we're gonna talk about is sugar maple. That happens to be my favorite this time of the year as we're making um, maple syrup. It is opposite. Um, this one's a little different than the others. Uh, sugar maple's buds are pointed. So they're much more pointed, sharply pointed than the other maples we talked about. They have overlapping reddishy brown scales on them. The leaf scars are also U-shaped. Um, the twigs are very slender and they're usually brown in co color and or maybe to gray and they'll have noticeable lenticels so a lot of lenticels on them um, but very different than um, the other maples we looked at in terms of their buds much more pointed darker buds brown buds on it remember the box elder had rounded whitish buds and silver and red maple had rounded or somewhat pointed red buds so they really um, are different that way just in their buds Sugar maple has bark that's recognizable, but it's hard to describe because it's so variable. Um, it can be light tan um, in color all the way to dark and almost black at times. Um, the bark can be very smooth, especially on younger trees, um, turning kind of ridge and furrow, turning to broadly platy with age. And you can see the one on the right here is an older sugar maple with really platy bark on there. Um, but the ones on the left are more tight bark. So there's a lot of variation. It's something that you just have to see a lot of them and you start picking up on the different types of bark that sugar maple may have. Um, the one advantage uh, of sugar maple is it often holds onto some leaves throughout the winter. So if you're unsure, you can always go up and, and if you can find some leaves hanging on, you can verify uh, identification just by looking at some of those leaves. Now, sugar maple is a medium to large tree. It often has a broad canopy, a uh, rounded canopy where it has room to grow. But a lot of places where we see this, um, it's under the understory of oak hickory and throughout many parts of Illinois. It's a tree that's establishing um, kind of with that lack of disturbance. So you see a lot of young sugar maple in the forest nowadays and it's not doesn't have that broad rounded canopy because it's growing in the shade of a lot of other trees. So it has more of a narrow canopy as it's reaching towards the trying to get some light. Uh, it does prefer rich, well-drained woods. Um, but so that'd be coves, areas, north facing slopes, but it can grow in a lot of areas. And like I said now, 
much of our standard kind of upland hardwood forest throughout Illinois has a fairly consistent layer of sugar maples in the understory. You can see it quite a bit around. Um, it happens to be very shade tolerant, so it can handle those conditions. Alrighty, so those are our maples. Again, there's so many species, I know we got to cover them kind of fast, unfortunately, but hopefully we, we talked about the different characteristics and how to tell them apart. I'm going to move to the next group, uh, which are ash species. Ash are, as another group are opposite as well. There's five ash species here in Illinois. I'm going to talk about the two most common, white ash and green ash. So ashes in general uh, have usually stout, straight twigs. And you can use that, um, and you can see that characteristic even from a long distance away. Um, if you look at the branching pattern, it's a noticeable opposite branching pattern that you can see from a distance. And those twigs are fairly stout and often very straight. And to me, that really stands out where you can be driving down the interstate and see ash trees. And just by that alone, you can tell they're ash trees. Um, ashes have dark buds, really, really dark buds that are kind of flat, usually the terminal bud. And the terminal bud is usually sandwiched with two lateral buds right next to it. They call it a little bishop's hat or something. And you can see that in this picture on the top right where we have the terminal bud there, but right against it are two lateral buds hugging right up against that. And that dark brown color really um, points right to ash trees. So that's a great way to identify ash. In general, ash trees have a diamond shaped bark. So it's a ridge and furrow type bark that interlaces in these diamond shapes. And like we talked about on Monday, nowadays this blonding uh, that you see due to emerald ash borer um, impacts and, and woodpeckers feeding on the emerald ash borer larvae is a common feature you see in a lot of ash trees. So if you see a grove of trees and there's a lot of blonding, that's a good indication that you might be looking at ash trees as well. But just jumping into the species. So white ash is the first one. Um, white ash is opposite, like all ashes. Uh, the buds are dark brown. And the key here with those are the leaf scars on, um, on white ash form a crescent shape that kind of circles around the, um, the lateral buds. And you can see that on these pictures. The picture on the left, you see the, the, the lateral bud there with the um, leaf scar kind of surrounding it, circling it on the sides and the bottom. In the middle picture, you see the same thing with the, the lateral bud and a horseshoe shaped, if you will, um, leaf scar and even here as well. And that's important because that's the easiest way to tell white ash from green ash is this leaf scar. Is it a, is it a horseshoe shape? or not. If you look at the bundle scars inside of the leaf scar, they kind of make a smiley face a little. There's a bunch of small dots in a semicircle as well. Uh, the twigs are moderately stout with white ash. It does have some lenticels on it as well, but it's a fairly stout twig. Now the bark on white ash is tan to light brown in color, shallow ridges, um, often diamond shaped pattern, like we said. There's a lot of people or some people that'll say that you can really tell the difference between white ash and green ash just by the bark. And they'll say sometimes white ash has more of a blocky bark. I've looked at a lot of them and I think the variation is great enough that that's a pretty hard task to tell white ash from green ash just from the bark. I don't see a lot of differences in them or I see enough variation in both species that it's hard to pick out differences. I rely on those twigs. White ash is a large fast growing tree, uh, very upright in nature, typically with a narrow ascending crown. Um, it is a habitat generalist somewhat, but overall it prefers well-drained uh, upland soils. And so you tend to find this one in drier sites um, than you do green ash, uh, which tends to prefer more of the wetter sites, although they grow right next to each other a lot of times. So that's white ash. So green ash, very similar, um, opposite 
dark brown buds, but look at the leaf scars on this twig as compared to the last one. You've got the you've got the lateral bud and then the leaf scar is kind of a, a rounded or shield shape and it sits below the leaf scar. The white ash, it sat um, kind of nestled down into the leaf scar. Um, now the leaf scar is below the bud. So there's the bud and below it is the leaf scar. So it sits above the leaf scar is what I meant to say. Um, twigs are moderately stout as well. The bundle scars do form a semicircle in the leaf scar like that as well. The big difference between green ash and white ash when you're trying to identify them is the location of the bud in relation to the leaf scar. This bud is above the leaf scar, green ash. The, the bud is kind of nestled down into the leaf scar and the leaf scar is a horseshoe shape with white ash. Bark is light brown to tan in color, um, diamond shape pattern. Um, again, very similar to, to white ash, hard to tell them apart. Green ash is a medium to large, fast growing tree. They can get big. Um, the picture on the right there is actually a picture of the former state champion green ash. Uh, it was 130 some feet tall and um, almost, it was over four feet in diameter. A, it, we lost it in a storm a couple years ago, unfortunately, but that's what it looked like beforehand. Um, forms variable, it can be spreading or upright, kind of depending on where it's growing. Um, this one, even though it prefers well-drained bottomlands, you see it growing everywhere. Um, it's usually one of the first trees to colonize um, abandoned areas or, or open areas. You'll see it on roadsides, in ditches, in fields that are um, kind of left to be abandoned to regrow. Uh, it's usually one of the first species to move in because of those wind dispersed seeds. Um, so even though it does tend to prefer well-drained bottomlands, you'll find it growing kind of anywhere. There's, it's, it's, it's another one of those true habitat generalists. Alrighty, so let's take a look at this picture and I'll pull up a poll for you all in terms of which one of these is the green ash, the left one or the right one. So I've got a poll up here and tell me which one is green ash and which one is um, white ash. Glad to see everybody voting. I'll give you a couple more seconds here, another 10 seconds or so to vote. So again, I like this picture because you can see the difference in the location of the bud in relation to the leaf scar. All right, five more seconds. All righty. And as the majority of you said, the one on the left is the green ash. That's right. The bud is sitting above the leaf scar. The one on the right is white ash with the bud nestled down into the leaf scar. So there we go. Excellent job. Um, moving right along. The next one, and, and I'm trying to cover most of the opposite ones first, and then we'll get into the alternate ones. Um, so flowering dogwood, it's common in the, the lower two thirds uh, of Illinois, uh, although it is a ornamental and planted widely outside of that. Um, it is opposite. And this is an interesting one in that um, it has different types of buds out there. So it has flower buds, which are the big uh, Hersey's Kiss shaped buds that you'll see at the end of the branches. And so those are the ones that are most recognizable. Those branches curve up and they'll have those big flower buds um, that are sitting there all throughout the winter, super recognizable. You see the picture on the right, but the normal terminal buds are actually much smaller, uh, reddish in color and pointed. And you see that on the pictures on the left. Lateral buds are even smaller, um, hard to even pick out. They're so small in there. Really the easiest way, as long as the, the tree is large enough to be producing flowers, easiest way to identify this one in the winter are those Hersey Kiss shaped big flower buds on it, on the twigs that tend to curve up at the tip. The bark on uh, 
flowering dogwood is a dark brown color, sometimes almost reddish, and it's very blocky and it's separated into these squarish or octagonal blocks um, on there. Uh, to me, it's very recognizable. Um, as it, younger bark will be squarish uh, and thin, but as it gets older, it does tend to form this rounded or octagonal shape and be a little bit thicker bark. But to me, it's probably one of the most recognizable bark patterns out there in the woods. If you see that kind of octagonal look to it, uh, you know you're looking at a, um, a flowering dogwood. It's really recognizable. This is a small tree. Uh, it has a rounded or spreading canopy usually, uh, and it's an understory tree. So you'll find it growing under um, overstory trees. It likes that. It's fairly shade tolerant, although it does like the edges where it'll flower some more. But you'll find it in rich forest, in coves, north facing slopes, any place with a little bit of moisture, um, you'll find it growing as an understory tree. Um, although again, it likes a little bit more light when it because it'll really flower more uh, in those areas. You can see here on the picture um, in the bottom left, you can see all those flower buds standing out on the twigs that kind of curve upward. That to me is the 60 mile an hour ID feature. It really stands out that way. All righty, let's move into our alternate species. And so um, everyone we looked at before were opposite, had opposite arrangement. Now we're jumping into the alternate arrangements. Uh, I wanted to start when we talk about alternate trees with black walnut because I think it's one of the easiest trees to identify by its twigs in the winter. Um, it's just got so many neat looking characteristics that jump out to you. Uh, it, it is alternate. Uh, the buds are large and grayish in color and hairy kind of fuzzy buds or hairy buds on there, a larger size. Um, and then the leaf scars on there, and we saw these already a couple times, but they are distinctly three lobed or kind of rounded heart shaped with three distinct zones of bundle scars. And people call it the monkey face. And you can see that here, right? You've got an eye, an eye, and then the smiley face kind of in the middle. So that three lobed or rounded heart shape to the leaf scar with the three uh, groupings, uh, clear groupings of the, your bundle scars inside the leaf scar really are recognizable. You see that, you know you're looking at um, a black walnut. So I really like those, I think they're cool looking. Um, the twigs are stout, so there's a larger twig. Dark brown, it's usually got a lot of hair on them as well, so that stands out. And then the best way, if you're unsure it might be, is that you want to slice it open. So that's why you want to carry a pocket knife when you're doing winter tree ID. Slice open that twig to look at the pith on the inside. The pith on black walnut is going to be light brown in color when it's especially when it's young like this, small twigs, and it's going to be chambered. You see that in the bottom left picture there. Um, the pith is not solid. It's not a hollow pith. It's a chambered pith. Um, so when you slice it, uh, lengthwise like that, it looks like a little ladder coming up. And that's always like the final uh, verification that what you're looking at is black walnut. Is slice it open. If it's got that chambered pith like that and it has the little monkey face leaf scars, you're looking at black walnut. So one of my favorite trees to identify or teach people to identify in the winter. Uh, in terms of bark, a dark brown, almost black, thick bark, heavily ridged and furrow. It may have a diamond size, diamond pattern size, uh, shape or diamond si diamond pattern to it. Um, that's especially apparent on the medium sized trees. So the picture in the middle there, you can see it's a little lighter in color. It gets its darker color with age, but you can really see the diamond pattern to that. Um, as it ages, again, kind of thicker, heavier, ridge and furrow. Um, the inner bark underneath of that is going to be kind of a dark chocolate brown in color as well. But a really a recognizable tree, um, even just by the bark. Walnuts are medium to large trees, often with a um, spreading crown, a big spreading crown. If it's in a forest grown situation, they'll be often can be very tall and uh, long trunks with a long distance between um, before they get to the first limb. Um, they do prefer rich sites with deep well-drained soils. 
although you do see them colonizing open areas fairly quickly. I'm sure it's animals moving around the fruit. Um, you can see the picture there in the middle. This is an old field site and it's got a bunch of young walnut coming up in it like that. Um, but to me, when I'm looking for walnut, it has very stout twigs and that jumps out to you. So you see the, the, the branches at the top of the tree, fairly hefty, that dark, uh, really dark colored bark and really rough ridge furrowed bark. Um, even from a distance, you can pick that out and um, you can identify black walnut that way. All right, moving on, uh, yellow poplar. This is one that I put in here, um, even though it's not that common of a tree throughout a lot of Illinois, it's super common in the lower third of the state. So I, I put it in here because um, it's a unique tree. It's got some neat characteristics to look at and where it's at, it, it can be ultra common. Um, yellow poplar is the name that I often call it. You may know it as tulip tree or tulip poplar. There's a bunch of names for it. Um, it's an alternate uh, alternate arrangement, and it's going to have large buds, particularly the terminal buds have valvate scales. And so most of the ones we've talked about have those imbricate scales that are almost like shingles that overlap each other. This has valvate scales. So there's really just two scales on the bud that meet up together. They, they, don't, they don't overlap at all. You can see that it kind of looks like a duckbill, people call it, right? So it's a duckbill uh, terminal bud. It's usually waxy and in, in, uh, the, the bud itself or the twigs are often waxy. So you have this kind of coating on it that you can rub off. The leaf scars are um, nearly perfectly round. And then often they'll have a stipule scar, which is a little um, line that encircles the twig right at each leaf scar. So you can see on the picture on the left, that's really noticeable that each leaf scar has that little stipule scar, that little line that goes all the way around the twig. Um, sometimes twigs can be pretty stout, sometimes they're very slender, so that, that's not a good characteristic. But the, the, the duck-billed terminal buds and those uh, rounded leaf scars with the, with, this, with the line that goes all the way around the twig um, really will get you to yellow poplar fairly quickly. Uh, it's another one that you can identify fairly easily just by the bark. So it is a ridge and furrow bark. It's kind of one of the classic ones. It may have somewhat of a diamond pattern. Um, it's a light gray, maybe the light brown in color. But to me, what stands out with yellow poplar are the ridges themselves are very flat on top. So they come up and they're almost like a square, right? They're almost square on top. So very flat topped ridges um, that, that show up and then the furrows or the lower parts, the furrows are often lighter in color. And that's a little unusual where the lighter color is in the, the deeper parts of the bark. And you can see that um, easily on the picture, um, the smaller picture on the right, the younger bark, you can see the furrows in there, they're starting to form and they're all really light colored. But it even stands out on the big picture on the right or the picture on the left. And to me that squarish flat top on the ridges with the light, lighter color in the furrows um, really jumps out to me as recognizable um, for yellow poplar. Now this is a large tree and in fact it's the largest uh, hardwood tree in America. It can be the tallest especially and one of the, the tallest trees in all of the eastern United States. There's examples of yellow poplar in um, the southern Appalachians and really good growing sites that are approaching 200 feet tall. Um, I've measured them here in Illinois over 130 feet tall. So they are a fast growing, big, tall tree, though they typically have a relatively small crown. So they don't have a huge overwhelming canopy usually. Um, their trunks are often very straight with little taper and it's often a long distance before you get to the first uh, lateral branches on it. So in form wise, you're looking for those tall, straight um, trunks. I, if, if anybody's a, a bow hunter out there, this is the perfect tree to choose for a, a climbing tree stand because there's no branches and it's straight and no taper. So it really jumps out that way. This is one that prefers rich sites with deep soils, but it has wind dispersed seeds and uh, it can grow all over the place. You often see huge stands of young yellow poplar 
kind of following canopy disturbance or storm damage or something like that because it can just overwhelm a place with its seeds. Um, one kind of couple unique features that you'll see on this, a lot of times where it's self pruned lower branches, you'll have these inverted U's on it like that. And you can they'll often stand out like you see in the middle picture there. Uh, it really stands out and really noticeable. Um, you can see that even from a great distance. And then many times the, the remnants of the fruit, um, as they open up and all the seeds which are wind dispersed leave, it has these little tulip looking um, fruit remnants and they often they'll hang on well throughout winter as well. So once you're familiar with it, it's one of the most easily recognizable trees, um, just even by form out in the woods. Alrighty, moving on, uh, sycamore. Sycamore is probably one of my favorite trees. Um, in terms of their twigs, they have a cap-like uh, terminal or the scales on the buds. So the buds are red in colored, cone-shaped, and they have a cap-like scale. Uh, the leaf scars actually completely encircle the buds. So if you look at the leaf scar and look at them, they'll be all the way around the buds. And then um, the buds or the twigs themselves are somewhat thin, light brown to red in color and they often have a noticeable zigzag shape. And so that really stands out to me. The bark on sycamore is extremely variable. Um, we mentioned this on Monday, uh, but it can go all the way from uh, kind of heavy, dark brown, thicker bark at the base of a tree to flaky and peeling and, and thin. Um, and then all the way from dark brown, light brown, white, green, red in color. Um, so it's very, very variable. Overall, usually sycamore is going to be dark brown, thicker bark at the base. And as you work your way up the tree, it gets flakier and flakier on all the way to the top of the tree where it's smooth and, and white in color. Really, really a neat looking tree. Um, it's a large, fast growing tree. It can be open, spreading, uh, really big trees with huge side branches or it can be narrow and ascending with a small canopy if it's growing in a tight bunch of them. Uh, it does prefer wet bottomlands and riparian areas. This is can be one of the largest trees in Illinois. I mean huge trunks. Um, it'll colonize wet areas, uh, open areas easily because it has a lot of wind dispersed seeds. One characteristic that I like on um, smaller where you can get to the twigs and see them Oftentimes you'll see these old anthracnose scars on the twigs and you see that here on the picture on the left, bottom left. Um, anthracnose is a, is a disease that inflicts sycamore um, almost annually. And so you'll get these scars uh, like that on the left there um, constantly on the twigs. And so to me that jumps out and makes it easy to, to pick them out as well. But another one of those that you can identify even from a long distance, right? You see that white top of the trees, it really jumps out to you. Uh, just a gorgeous tree, one of the prettiest trees I think in Illinois. The next group I'm gonna talk about are elms. Now there's three elms in Illinois. Um, oh, and there's another asterisk that I forgot. So don't ask about why winged elm it has an asterisk in front of it because it shouldn't. But elms in general are um, alternate, very thin twigs, soft spongy bark. Uh, the two I'm going to talk about are American elm and red elm, or also called slippery elm. Those are the two most common that you'll find all across um, the state. The first is American elm, which has the distinction of being the most common tree in Illinois. If you look at some of the survey data, um, there's more American elms than any other tree species uh, in Illinois. It is alternate. The buds are very small, pointed, reddish brown in color. Um, the leaf scars are very, very narrow. They're usually held really tight to the buds, so they're hard to even see. Um, sparsely hairy or smooth. Um, the flower buds will swell in midwinter and they'll be larger and rounded as you get towards the, the late part of winter. Um, but American elm twigs are some of the thinnest twigs you'll find. They're very, very thin and they often grow in a zigzag pattern. Now to me, the easiest way to identify American elm is by its bark. 
the bark is soft, spongy. You can stick your thumbnail into it and it'll indent in there. Um, it's often light, light tan or brown in color, but it has a very, very patchy look to it. It'll have, it's not just a consistent one color. And you see that in the picture in the middle here where it's got a lot of different patches of colors. Now, as it thickens, as the tree ages and it gets thicker bark, um, you can break a piece of that bark off and it's going to be layered. It's going to have multiple layers of bark and it's got a really distinctive light and dark banding um, layers to that bark. And you can see that in the two pictures on the left where I took and broke a piece of bark off on um, off from a tree. And you can see there's dark red and light colored and bandings. That is very, very um, distinctive to American elm. That soft bark, that's a that layered bark that's dark and light banding. You can even kind of pick that out when you just even look at the bark because you see all those colors reflected in the bark. Um, American elm historically was actually quite a large tree. Now due to Dutch elm disease, most of the American elms that we have on the landscape are medium sized or small trees. Um, the large ones usually, they, they don't make it uh, as large as they used to, um, mostly. But the form on American elm is usually strongly V-shaped. So the branches are ascending. There's narrow branch unions, so they're tight unions, uh, small angles. And so it gives the, the tree an overall kind of invert or V-shape um, or a vase shape that's very, very recognizable to me at that, that form of a tree where it's very, very strongly V-shaped and the branches are all really ascending, jump out to me and it's, it's really recognizable. And the other thing is just those really, really thin branches. We talked about black walnut and just the thick and stoutness of their twigs stand out from a distance. How thin and wispy these twigs are really stand out as well. So I think you can figure it out that way. Um, prefers moist bottom lands. That's kind of historically where it grew, but now it grows all across the landscape in a lot of disturbed areas. So second growth forest, abandoned fields, you'll see a lot of elm. Again, the most common tree in Illinois right now is American elm. So let's contrast that with red elm. So red elm is also called slippery elm. Um, it is another fairly common tree and there's a, sometimes those two get mixed up quite a bit. Um, some of the differences, the buds of red elm tend to be darker in color and they tend to have kind of orange tufts uh, of hair on them that really jump out that way. Their twigs are a little thicker um, than American elm, but they're still pretty thin twigs. But really the best way to tell them apart Again, it's by the, the bark. We talked about the, the layered bark in American elm with the different colors. Red elm is going to have thick spongy bark, ridge and furrowed um, as well. But when you break a piece of it off, it's going to be kind of a continuous red or reddish brown color. So it has layered bark, but all the layers are going to be that same red brown color and you won't have that banding like you do in American elm. So when I see an elm, and I'm sure it's an elm, the first thing I do is break off a little piece of that bark and then look at the layers and decide, with, is it American elm or red elm? Often late in the, the season, so this time of year right now, um, the buds are really starting to swell. They swell really early on red elm. So you can see those swollen buds um, stand out really easily. You can see it on the bottom left there. Um, it Red elm doesn't have as strong, as strong of a V shape as American elm does, um, but it has somewhat of that, but it's more of a rounded or a flat top canopy. And it is also a habitat generalist. It's found in a lot of uh, variety of locations it, and it does well in those disturbed landscapes. So remember the bark is how to tell them apart, right? And so let's pull up another pole very quickly. And which one of those two is American elm, right? And so you look at the banding and we can, uh, it's, it's, it, once you see it enough, it's, it's fairly easy. Sometimes uh, young American elm, you can't, uh, the, the bark's so thin, you can't really see the banding as well. But on larger individuals, taking, a, a, taking your knot pocket knife and slicing a little bit of the bark or breaking a little bit off will have you 
instantly tell the difference between the two. All right, I'll give you about five more seconds. Everybody's doing a great job. Alrighty, I'm gonna go ahead and end it, even though people are still voting. And you all are right. Uh, by and large, everybody, most everybody got the one on the left is American Elm. You can see the red, white, red, white, red banding from a slice as compared to the one on the, the right here, the red elm, where it's just solid red color. So good job. So American elm versus red elm. Now uh, a third tree that can sometimes be misidentified or confused for elms when they're smaller is hackberry. Uh, it's also a tree with very, very thin twigs. Um, in terms of identifying it from the twig, hackberry lacks a terminal bud, so it doesn't have a true terminal bud. So if you look at the ends of the twigs and you see that in the small picture that's uh, bordered in red here, that it has just a lateral bud at the end that kind of sticks off to the side instead of being a true terminal bud. The lateral buds themselves are usually um, triangular in shape and brown and lay flat against the twig, except for that last one, which juts off at a funny angle. And the twigs are often very thin, zigzag in color, or zigzag in, in shape with light colored lenticels. And then if you slice them open, hackberry at the nodes, so at the, if you find those um, bud scale scars where it started growing, um, a, a new one and slice it open and expose the pith kind of at those nodes, it'll have chambered pith, but not everywhere else. So it's kind of strange that way. So you slice it open, you'll have parts of the pith that are chambered like you see here and parts that aren't. So just another uh, easy way to kind of verify that it's, it's hackberry. Hackberry bark in general is smooth, tight and light gray and it's covered often with uh, these hard layered warts. I guess you, the best thing I can call them is warts. There are little warts on it that have a lot of bands on them or, or, or uh, layers on them that are very hard. And now the density of those warts vary greatly. I've seen hackberries that are almost completely wartless and smooth. It looks like a beech tree all the way to where it's so warty that it coalesces together and it forms ridges on the tree like you see on the picture. The bottom picture on the right is, uh, these are all hackberry, but that's kind of showing the, the three pictures on the bottom show the extreme of wartiness, I guess you would say, um, of hackberry. Uh, it is a medium to large tree, usually tall, straight, branchless trunk, um, thin branches when you get to the top, uh, it really jumps out. It is a habitat generalist. It's able to grow on a wide range of sites. We do have a closely related uh, tree called sugarberry that grows particularly in Southern Illinois. And you'll hear people say that you can tell them apart by the wartiness where sugarberry doesn't have many warts and hackberry has a lot of warts. I've looked at a ton of these and I don't think that's consistent. Um, I think that you will find uh, sugarberries with a lot of warts and you'll find hackberries with no warts. So it's pretty hard to tell apart. If you look at the, the um, keys, the one characteristic they use to separate them is the size of the lateral buds, where hackberry has usually a little bit bigger lateral buds up to a quarter of an inch long, where sugarberry has smaller lateral buds that are an eighth of an inch long or so. Moving on to another super common tree that we find across the state, black cherry. Uh, black cherry, the buds are sharply pointed uh, reddish brown and they're covered in those noticeable uh, scales, imbricate scales, so they're overlapping scales. Uh, the twigs are very thin uh, on this one, reddish to gray in color. Um, they may, as it gets a little bit of size, they'll develop some silvery blotching to the twigs and they have numerous uh, lenticels that really stand out to you and I think that's an easy way to identify um, species in that prunus genus is that their twigs are often covered in these lenticels. Now, as the tree grows, uh, those lenticels will start forming. We talked about this on Monday, those 
kind of horizontal lines. They'll coalesce and they'll stretch into these horizontal lines. And then that'll kind of stick with the tree throughout its life, where even later on with its bigger bark, you can still see those horizontal lines on there. So even though it starts out as smooth bark, as it gets bigger, it develops these small plates that are often a shiny silver surface to them. Um, I've heard it uh, been described as burnt potato chip look to that because you ha I have no idea why they call it that, but there it is. But to me, it's that shiny silvery uh, look to the front of the plates uh, along with those horizontal lines really jump out to me as it being black cherry. Now on the in the furrows and the inside, it's going to be almost a black color. Black cherry is a medium to large tree and some areas in good soils, they can be quite large and quite uh, nice forms. Overall, usually in Illinois, what I see are um, trees that are more crooked, branchy, poor form trees. Um, this one for me is one of those fence rows trees. You see it growing in fence rows, old fields, second growth sites, areas where there's been canopy disturbance. You see a lot of uh, black cherry growing in those sites. That's typically where I see more black cherry than in more traditional um, well-drained forest are these kind of second growth or edge habitats. So ironwood is the next. Um, it's also called Eastern Hop Hornbeam. I like ironwood, it's an easier name to remember. Uh, it's alternate. This is a small tree. I put it in here, even though it's an understory tree, it doesn't get very big, uh, but it is commonly found throughout the whole state. This is another one with thin twigs, buds that are very small, sharply pointed. Um, they can be hairy kind of at the, at the end of the twigs. And they often, the, the buds often come out from the twig at a, at a broad angle. So they kind of really noticeably stick out from the tree. Um, they often hold their leaves, sometimes some leaves, into the winter. But to me, the bark is really the easy way to identify um, ironwood. It has very, very thin, narrow vertical strips that'll peel or flake off easy. Um, they break easy. You can rub your hand against it and break them off that way. Um, on larger individuals, those thin, narrow vertical strips, strips will often twist as you go along the main trunk. Usually the side branches come off at a, a noticeable angle as well, but the bark is really that light brown, uh, peeling, flaky, thin bark, uh, really is recognizable for ironwood. Again, small understory tree, usually a single straight trunk with lateral branches that are thin and they come off at uh, 90 degree angles um, and has a really small crown to it. So you're looking for that small understory tree um, rarely do they get bigger than six, seven inches in diameter. So it is three o'clock and I knew I would go over, but I have a handful more trees. So if you can hang with me for a little bit, we'll cover the rest of the trees. And I apologize for going over, but I have a few that I want to cover. Uh, the next is sassafras. Sassafras is common in the lower two thirds of the state. Um, one of my favorite trees as well. Uh, this one's easily identified. Um, the buds are very large, particularly the, the terminal buds are large, green in color, usually overlapping scales that are real noticeable. The twigs are interesting in that they're moderately thick. Um, they're usually green in color, although that varies. You see the picture on the right, it's black. It's kind of have a black soot on it. Sometimes they can be brown or even reddish in color as well, um, but oftentimes they're green. They're gonna be waxy or sooty covering like that. Um, moderately thick, like I said, and curve upward towards the tip usually. And if you break open the twigs, uh, damage them and smell them, they're gonna smell like Fruit Loops almost, really a, a, an unusual smell uh, that stands out. It's really a easy way to identify sassafras. It's break them open and smell them. You, they really do smell like Fruit Loops. Now the bark is dark reddish brown. If you slice open the bark, it's going to have that really red coloration underneath of it or, or almost orange coloration. It's also going to smell just like the, the broken twigs. Um, it may have some light silvery colors in the furrows uh, of light smaller stems like this, and it can have somewhat of a diamond pattern as well to its kind of ridge and furrows. 
Uh, it's a small to medium sized tree. It's often twisted and scraggly in appearance. Uh, it's a clonal tree, which means it'll grow uh, from its base and have a bunch of, um, you know, bunch of sprouts coming up. So often you'll find these big patches of it and it's shade intolerant. So it'll grow up. It's often short lived and so it'll start falling apart. So I see this one in fence rows um, all the time or open areas um, that are just scraggly poor form looking trees. Uh, the next honey locust, super common tree found all across the state. Uh, this one's interesting. You think you can identify honey locust easily and a big tree we can, but if you look at the twigs, they're actually somewhat strange looking and people often don't pay attention to them. The, the buds are tiny, very, very tiny on honey locusts and they're recessed into the twigs at these swollen nodes so much so that you can barely see the buds. They're kind of hidden back in there. They're kind of covered over by these swollen areas or covered up, covered up by the leaf scar. Um, the twigs are moderately slender, reddish to brown in color and often have a very, very strong zigzag pattern. And you can have thorns even uh, on these twigs. Now, of course, the bark, um, if you stay away from the thorn, don't think about the thorns, but just think about the bark because there are thornless trees that are out there. Its bark is dark gray tight and smooth when it's younger um, and it becomes kind of broadly platy uh, and somewhat peeling um, as it gets older. So these big broad hard plates um, and that middle size trees you look at the fissures where it's starting to break apart and usually you have a, a reddish color in there. But of course the easy way to identify honey locust are these large branch thorns that occur on the stems, the trunk, everywhere. That's um, if you have those it's super easy. This can be a medium up to a large tree, uh, often multiple trunks, broken limbs, a twisted appearance. A lot of times it doesn't have a beautiful form. It has a wide habitat tolerance. It likes bottomlands, but you can find it in anywhere. And it really loves disturbed areas, fence rows and pastures. You see a lot of it looking like this, where it's just moving into a pasture and um, forming these big thickets for sure. Alrighty, I have, I think, two more species I'll cover quickly. Sweet gum is another one, kind of like tulip tree or yellow poplar, that it's not found across the state, but it's so common down here that I wanted to include it. Uh, it's an alternate tree. Buds are very large. There's noticeable scales on the, on the, the buds. The, sometimes the scales are often dark tipped and oftentimes they're resinous, so they're a little sticky. So you can rub against them or break them a little bit and you'll have to get your sticky fingers. Uh, they can be reddish to green in color, uh, the buds can. The leaf scars are U-shaped or rounded, but there's three noticeable bundle scars uh, in the leaf scars. The twigs can be stout, are st stout, and they may have quirky wings, particularly on the younger individuals. So we see here the picture on the bottom left, you see that really quirky winging to it. The bark itself is very spongy, very soft, almost like American elm. You can stick your thumbnail into it. Um, as it ages, it'll get this strong ridge and furrowed, but it's more of a rounded ridge and furrow. Um, can be very, very thick at times. Uh, and then dark brown to gray in color, it varies in color, but that kind of rounded ridge and furrow, thick bark that's very, very soft will get you at sweet gum. This is a large tree. A uh, tall tree, it often has straight trunks in a forested situation, uh, big well-developed canopies. Um, it can form clonal patches, so you can have dense patches of young sprouts, particularly in disturbed areas. And this prefers wet bottomlands and riparian areas. That's where you'll see it growing. Uh, oftentimes the gumballs are no, will hang on throughout winter and you can easily identify it um, even just by that. But this is an interesting one that just yesterday we identified the new state champion sweet gum down at Cypress Creek National Wildlife Refuge. And this was 126 feet tall, so a beautiful sweet gum. Alrighty, last tree. Thank you all for sticking with me here. Uh, is redbud. I love redbud. I wanted to make sure it included in here. It's a beautiful tree. When it's flowering, it's unmistakable. But even in the winter, this is an easy one to identify. Red buds in general lack a true terminal bud. It'll have lateral buds throughout them that are um, tiny and dark brown. 
Um, but really the, the, the easy buds to identify are the flower buds. So the flower buds are rounded, larger, and almost black in color. Um, they often occur in these strong or, or thick clusters. And you can see that on the picture on the right, where you have clusters of all these flower buds all together. And that's what forms, of course, those big clusters of flowers in the spring. But those dark black buds, um, strongly zigzag thin twigs, really make it easy to pick out red bud, particularly with flowering individuals. The bark is dark brown in color. Uh, it can be scaly or even platy as it gets up with age, but it's going to have reddish inner bark that you'll see as the bark starts to age and break into these fissures. You can look in there and you'll see that kind of reddish color to it. Redbud is a small tree, uh, usually has sh very short trunks or it's multi-stemmed, uh, limmy, spreading canopy, branches low to the ground. Uh, you'll see this at forest edges or canopy openings growing into old fields and it can get weedy very fast. It produces a ton of seed and it spreads very easily. So in the right conditions, you can get overwhelmed with uh, redbud sprouts and seedlings all over the place. A couple unique features are those scar clusters from old uh, flowering sites really jump out on older individuals as well as the short flat uh, seed pods that often hang on into winter that are easy to identify and pick out um, all throughout all throughout the winter as well. So those are good characteristics to identify. <laughs> 